Relationships. They're everywhere. And they all come with something. Strings. Laughs. Baggage. Love. Obligations. Rules. Requirements. The only thing they don't come with is an owner's manual, a map, a set of instructions custom made for your unique relationships. So over time, our relationships can fade, fracture, fall apart, and without help, that damage can seem beyond repair. What if there was an owner's manual, a map, a set of instructions custom made for your unique relationships? It's all relative. A Biblical Guide to Relationships. Hey, everybody. As you may know, we've started a year-long Bible reading program through the one-year uh, Bible, and it's a super fun time for us to kind of search through the scriptures together. And one of the things that um, we wanted to do is to answer one of those questions a week. You know, as you're reading, sometimes you come across stuff that you're just like, I have no idea what this means. And so um, if you have a question like that, email it in to van at vistachurch.com, and every week we're going to be focusing on one of those questions right before the sermon. And today's question is a fun one. It's this. Why was there so much family favoritism with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Uh, that is a fun and difficult question, um, but one of the things you'll see in Scripture, and it happens multiple times, whenever there's this kind of human favoritism, you know, favorite child, all that, what do you expect? It's not going to go well, right? Like, if you have a favorite kid, the other kid's going to feel bad about it. There's just going to be strife and family problems all throughout, and that's what we see both in the Old Testament and different times in the New Testament when there's, um, you know, favoritism as like national favoritism, all that kind of stuff, it never goes well, right? So for me, one of my lessons as I'm reading through the scriptures, I'm thinking about the fact that I've got two young kids and on any given day, they can test me not having favoritism. Okay, not a good joke. Okay, don't do that. Uh, it's just, it's tough because there are times where you want to honor a child's faithfulness and, and that's the reality. Though, we don't have favorites. Each child needs to be raised completely differently, right? And every friend you have needs to be treated differently. Now, one of the questions you might have is, well, does that mean you're showing favoritism? And the answer is no. You can be impartial and yet still treat people differently. Think of it this way. I'll keep this real tight. Think of it this way. If you walk into a courtroom and you see a judge, you know, up on his judge stand, you would expect that judge to not show favoritism for somebody, right? Like, you remember the, the symbol for justice is a woman with two scales and she's got a blindfold over her eyes. You would expect that judge to not treat someone. So if somebody's on trial for murder, say, and they're just covered in tattoos, and, you know, just they, they look real, I would say awesome, but you might not. That judge should not look at that person any differently. I mean, he should look at that person as if he doesn't know how much money they make or the religion or the color of their skin or what they like doing for fun. That judge should judge impartially. But at the end of that trial, if that person, if, if the judge is starting to be impartial, you would not expect for that judge to let that person stand up and walk out of the room with you, right? So just because a judge is impartial doesn't mean he treats everybody the exact same. And that's a lesson that I have to learn with my kids. Just because I'm impartial, I need to figure out what's the best way to raise this child with, you know, the type of discipline that they respond well to and, and the ways that they are encouraged to. And so in the Bible, does, uh, is there family favoritism? Yes. And it works out horribly every time. So, cool. That's my answer for this week's question. If you guys would welcome up Pastor Van. I hadn't had this thought, but if you ask my sister who was the favorite child, she would say me. And if you ask me who the favorite child was, I would tell you my sister. But <clears throat> that's, that's all in our heads. That has nothing to do with my, my parents. Anybody have the mom where, like there was one um, year, I had two brothers and a dad. She bought us all a suit. I got the gray one. My dad got the blue one. My brother, one got the brown one and one got the silver one or whatever, or the black one. It was just like we all had the exact same suit in different colors. That's the way my mom kept everything fair. So, But favoritism, as John said, is a big part of the mess of the book of Genesis. As we go through the patriarchs, which is where we are in the reading this last week. And uh, yeah, pretty much every time there's favoritism, it really messes things up. So I want to start with some of the... Don't have time for every crazy story uh, in Genesis. Um, 
really, really didn't intend this series to just like stick with the Old Testament. For those that are reading along, there's New Testament readings that, that go with this, and there's Psalms and Proverbs readings. But as we're talking about family things, Genesis just so much to pick from. So, first one is Laban and Jacob. Now, there's just weird things in the Old Testament. So when the patriarchs want to get married, what do they do? They go back home where, where Abraham was from, and they marry their cousins. How many think that's weird? Everybody but my sister. My sister, we had a gorgeous cousin that my sister, he was a year older than her, and she was madly in love with him most of her childhood, and so wished she could marry a cousin, and finally was convinced that, no, that's not good. So, anyway, don't know why they did that. It's just, it's just part of the deal. Um, but in going back home, he goes back to his uncle, Jacob does, and he, he falls in love with, with uh, uh, his cousin and um, wants to marry her. So, you know, Jake, uh, uh, Laban says, well, you know, what will you give me kind of a thing? He says, I'll work for you for seven years, right? So he's going to work for seven years. And then what does Laban do? The old switcheroo gives him the other daughter. And in his mind, this is okay because she's older and Jacob should have known that he couldn't get the one daughter until the other one was married. So, you know, switches it around, gives the one daughter, and then a week later gives him the daughter he wanted, and he has to work another seven years. So now 14 years have gone by. And Jacob is just, you know, who would want to live with a relative that treated you that way, right? Anybody here had relatives that, where there's been brokenness in your family for, like, decades, right? This is going to be two decades. This is 20 years, this craziness goes on. Well, then Jacob, to get even, kind of is doing things to deceive him as he's building up his own herds. And it's just deception, deception, treachery, treachery. It's horrible, right? So that's the first story. Second story, uh, Genesis 34. One day, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some of the young women who lived in the area. But when the local prince, Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite saw Dinah. He seized her and raped her, but then he fell in love with her, and he tried to win her affection with tender words. He said to his father, Hamor, get me this young girl. I want to marry her. Call me crazy. This is just like general information for guys. Don't be the most dangerous person in a girl's life if you want to marry her, right? You, you can't do that. I mean, a woman's heart is not made to... What he did was considered horrible. It was sin against her, sin against her household, all that kind of stuff. And now he wants to marry her and like, oh, we can make this work. Horrible, sick, bad, wrong, ugly, right? Well, Jacob doesn't do anything because his boys are out. The boys all come home. They all decide, okay, what, you know, what can we do to resolve this? Hamor is really trying to intervene and make it okay. He's going, you know, your young men can marry our girls and our young men can marry your girls and we'll become one people. How many know that's not the plan? Not the plan. So that's not a good idea. Jacob should be balking at that. He doesn't seem to be. And then they said, okay, we, this can happen, but all your men have to be circumcised. Talk about testing commitment, right? It's like, okay, you want this to happen? All your men have to be circumcised. And they go along with it, which to me is crazy, but they do. And then it's Levi and Simeon. Once these guys are three days into their healing process, just go in and wipe out everybody, slaughter everybody. All the men. They then take the women and children as slaves. How many think that's crazy? And they all had in their mind the narrative that made it all okay. Right? So at this point in, in Genesis as we're marching through, um, treachery, two. Uh, righteousness, zero. Right? And you're kind of going, these are the patriarchs. There should be just like righteousness that you're stumbling over left and right. The reality is there are some righteous things that happen, but there's all this brokenness and craziness. So today we're going to talk about brokenness. It's not just them. It's us too. How many, in some way, shape, or form, have either a broken family, a broken workplace, a broken friendship? I mean, it's out there. Right. So this is, this is our life, and we just get to maybe hopefully learn some lessons from the patriarchs as we do this. Now, it does say in, in uh, Romans chapter 3 that no one is righteous, not, not even one person. So I guess it makes sense that righteousness isn't scoring at all. This is all the, the broken and uh, treacherous stuff that seems to be happening. But if you fast forward, it says in Malachi 2.6, Malachi is the last book in the Bible, I mean, in the Old Testament. It's talking about the Levites. And this is what wounds me so much. It bugs me that it was Levi that did this. What would happen to Levi as, as the 
the family now becomes a, you know, a, a, a group of tribes and a nation. What, what, what's true of the Levites? They don't get an inheritance of land like all the other tribes. Why not? Because they will be the priests. They will be the holy people. They will be the, the, the spiritual people that are ministering to everybody else. They have a very special calling. And yet it's Levi, their namesake, who did this horrible thing. So anyway, that bugs me. I don't know if it bugs you. It bugs me. But in Malachi, talking about the Levites, it says, They walked with me, living good and righteous lives, and they turned many from lives of sin. Now, as we go into the, what we're studying this morning, that's actually a huge statement. They weren't just righteous. They, they caused righteousness to happen in the lives of other people. And that really is the point of all of this. Even in all of our brokenness, we are called to uh, promote righteousness in the lives of the people around us, right? So the Levites, at least at one point, were doing that. Now, um, in Ezekiel, says, in 14, chapter 14, verse 14, it says, Even Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, their righteousness would save no one but themselves, says the Sovereign Lord. So, pretty easy to see that Noah, Daniel, and Job, and I think we would all agree those were righteous people in the Old Testament. But in the end, their righteousness helps them out, doesn't really help anybody else out. But you definitely have righteous people. But Romans 3.10 says, all scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. Is anybody confused? This is what I'm trying to address today. Because I find this very confusing. And particularly if you, you don't dive in deep enough to see that there really are reasons why everything that was just said was said. But for us to do that, we, uh, we need to dig a little deeper. So, so far, you know, righteousness is not winning. Adam and Eve started out righteousness, righteous but lost it. Enoch... Walked with God, righteous guy, but we know that much about him. It's kind of like you could have put in a little more about Enoch. That would have really helped us out to figure this out. But Noah in, in chapter 6 was twice in the beginning of chapter 7. It says he was the only one that was righteous in his generation. So that's pretty clear. That it's not a real popular thing. But Noah was definitely righteous. And then we get to chapter 15, which is Abraham. And then that will go to the patriarchs. So, in verse 6 of chapter 15, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness because of his faith. So, this is my question. First little brain teaser here. Was Abraham righteous? Before we waste a lot of time at this, some of you will say, no, he was just considered righteous. That's different. And some will say, well, yeah, he was righteous. You know, I mean, he was righteous. You ready? When it comes down to whose eyes matter, whose eyes matter when it comes to righteousness? God's. So in God's eyes, was Abraham righteous? So was Abraham righteous? Yes. For me, you know, the only set of eyes on earth that really matter to me is my wife and probably my kids too. But my wife, right? I, I, my dad told me when, when I was in high school, I dated pretty girls who had good hearts. My wife and I talked about this recently and I don't think I ever dated a person who didn't have a good heart. I mean, I just, that's, that's what is attractive to me. But I also dated some very pretty girls in high school. But about halfway through college, I was just tired of superficial stuff. So I started dating rather plain girls who had beautiful hearts. And after I brought several of them home, my dad said, Son, your, your wife doesn't have to be beautiful to anybody but you, but she does have to be beautiful to you. And I took that to heart, so I married Deb. That was a really good directional thing there. <laughs> beautiful heart, beautiful person. That's the way that works. Okay, so in the end, who cares if people think you're righteous or not? I mean, quite honestly, one of the biggest complaints the world has against the church is that we're not perfect. Because to them, righteous means perfect. If you don't get anything else today, righteous doesn't mean perfect. It means you're in a right relationship with God and you are living your life in a way that pleases him and honors him, right? Where you're loving, respecting, and you're being a companion with God. That was last week's lens, the lens of family. This week, we're going to get to the lens of discipleship. But again, lens of family is very important, that we are a part of the family of God, right? But in the end, we're not perfect. How many people, you know people that when they became a believer, an addiction evaporated, a bad habit evaporated, uh, maybe something medical evaporated, and they just became a new person like instantly. Anybody know anybody like that? 
I, I could tell you dozens and dozens of people I've seen that when God moved in their life, I became a Christian in the Jesus movement, and God was doing miraculous things left and right back then. But I mean, all kinds of young people that were on hallucinogenic drugs and all this kind of stuff. And I have seen some just amazingly miraculous, they're suddenly fine. For me, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, I really, 16, I probably wasn't old enough to be into a lot of like, well, I was a serial killer and suddenly I didn't want to kill people anymore. It wasn't like that. It was, I used to swear, right? I mean, I was a typical 12, 13-year-old boy that realizes there is power in very small words. Use small words and you get a lot of shock value and, you know, you get, you get people's attention. You just don't do that in front of your dad, okay? It's just just word of advice. First time I did it, I barely survived the incident. I only did it one other time where I slipped in front of my dad, and I was in a Boy Scout camp out making the pancakes. And the cook always eats last. That's the Boy Scout way. And so I'm eating, and all my firewood getters and everything were, were long retired. And so I'm trying to cook a pancake on a fire that's dying. So I went to flip it, and it just, you know, and I went, oh, hmm. And my, my dad was standing right there, and I didn't realize it. So I said that, and then I looked over, and there's his knees right there. I, knit, I didn't even try to look up to his face. I was just, no, nope, don't, don't say anything. And my dad went, son, there's a time and a place for every word. And this would be it. That's what that looks like. So anyway, <laughs> so I just thought, the grace of God has fallen on me. Don't ever swear in front of your dad again. So anyway. But when I became a believer, I just stopped swearing. I didn't try to stop swearing. I mean, I'm talking that week. It just, I didn't do it anymore. And again, that's one of the things you have more. It's not like I was addicted to it. But, but it changes your life when you give your life to God. But I know other people that had serious addictions. I know other people that had serious infirmities. All kinds of brokenness in their life. And God said to them, I am going to live with you and walk with you. And we will process this together. And quite honestly, there have been times I'm thinking, God, this person over here is so nice, you know, and you're making them walk through this, this you know, horrible growth pattern. We just, just do it instantaneously. Be nice to them because they are such a nice person. And there's other times you think, that person's kind of creepy, and, and you just heal them instantly. That just, that doesn't make sense to me. But God knows what we need, and some people need the process. And some people need the, the instantaneous miracle. We're all different. Again, like John said, it's not like God is favoring one and not favoring another. He's doing to all of us what's best for us, right? So, in the old covenant, the righteousness seems so broken because there's so much brokenness going on at the same time as the righteousness. Newsflash, it's still that way today. In Jesus, you are righteous before God. And we need to, you know, we need to identify that and celebrate that, but it doesn't mean you've got it all figured out and you've got your act together. And when you start acting like you do, that's when you crash and burn. Be aware of your brokenness, but be aware of God's work in your heart and life. All right, so now with Abraham, you know, it says in uh, chapter 15, verse six, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness because of his faith. With that faith that Abraham had, as you walk through the story, there's going to be times where God tests that faith, and he's specifically looking for obedience, right? So when Abraham's in the old country, and God says, I want you to go to a new place, and I'm going to show you, there was no GPS, there was no map with names on it, there was, and even when they got there, how many here, when you grew up, you like moved in 30 times in your childhood or whatever, but you just moved all the time. That's Abraham. He gets to the promised land. It's not even like he gets to stay put. God says, okay, move here, move there, move there. But all of that is this demonstration of obedience that goes along with his faith, right? When he is asked to offer his son Isaac, the blessing that comes is because of his faith, but then also because of his obedience that was driven by faith. This is what it says in chapter 22, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. Sound familiar? Son, only son. God asked him to do what, what he was getting ready to do with his own son just to see if he was that committed to the process. 
And in the end, God obviously stops him. But through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed. Not just because of your faith, but because in faith you obeyed. Now, again, I'm doing this because some of you are going, well, that's confusing. This is by faith, not by works. And he's, obedient, he's being obedient, and that sounds like works to me. So what is it? Is it faith? Is it works? Is, what is it? Glad you asked. Now, um, as you finish out the Old Testament, you know, Lot is treated as righteous, but I really think it's because of his connection to Abraham. But if you remember, you know, Abraham says, well, God, if there's 50 righteous people around Lot, will you save his community? Well, how about 40? How about 30? How about 20? You know, Jewish people may have a reputation for dealing that way. But anyway, he's the original one, right? So he's, he's trying to negotiate God down, negotiate him down. God puts up with it till he gets to 10. God says, 10, great, let's do this. The only one that would have qualified would have been Lot himself. So there were none in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was destroyed. But if you think of the Levites, you think of the prophets, there's righteous people in the Old Testament. There are. And it's because of their faith. Not because of their works, but because of their faith. Now, when you get to the New Testament, before Jesus goes to the cross, you have Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna. You have Joseph of Arimathea. And you have Cornelius that are all clearly people. And Cornelius is a Gentile centurion demonstrating faith that God responds to, right? So it's, again, it's about faith. It's not about works. Now, what is faith? That would be the question. Now, most of us would think, well, we, we have a good picture of what faith is, but we live in a culture that has no idea what faith is, as in the faith of the Bible, right? So right now, I want everybody to stand up, if you're comfortable standing up, and I want you to sing the Orlando National Anthem. Well, actually, it'd be the Orlando City Anthem, here we go. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. Sound like faith? Like a bolt out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through. There's a high note there. Okay. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. You may be seated. Okay, good job. We live in a world where SeaWorld makes their big theme a few years back, believe. Right? You listen, we have a bazillion motivational speakers come to Orlando like every five minutes. And they're over at the convention center. They're one of our large facilities here. And they'll get up and they say, it's faith that makes our business the way it is. And you have to have faith in yourself. You have to have faith in our concepts and faith in our products. And faith, 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 faith. Believe, 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 believe. By the way, faith, believe. Believe is a verb. Faith is a noun. They mean the same thing. It's just one's the noun form, one's the verb form. Trust is also a related word. Okay, so you got to have faith. You got to believe. Is that what we're talking about? Wishing upon a star and hoping that fate will see us through? No, that's not faith at all. And yet we live in a world where we really start thinking, I just have to have faith. Faith in myself, faith in my family. And we leave God completely out of the mix. So let's get it right. Hebrews eleven six, Faith is believing. Anybody that comes to God must believe that God exists and rewards those who diligently seek him. That's my favorite biblical, de there's some others, but that's my favorite definition of faith. First, you're a seeker. You come to God. You are, you are looking to have a relationship with God. So if anybody wants a relationship with God, what do they have to do? They have to believe that he exists. They must trust in that existence and that he will reward them when they diligently seek him. That explains most of what we're seeing in the book of Genesis. You have these people, and, and Abraham is the beginning of the patriarchs, he believes that God exists and that he rewards those who will follow him in obedience, right? And that will lead to, um, I love James, the, the one translation, I forget which one it is, but it says faith uh, without corresponding action is dead. I love, because when we talk about works, then we get confused. Well, am I earning my faith or am I not earning my faith? In, in um, Romans, particularly chapter 3 and 4, those two things are, are positioned against each other. The opposite of works is faith. There is a, ESV says, there is a law of works and a law of faith. And they're, they're the opposite of each other. But faith does have corresponding actions. And you could call that 
works, but it's not earning your salvation. It's just responding to God in a loving way. So uh, let's do this. Uh, Romans 3.10 is where it says, no one is righteous, not even one. But then in verse 27, it says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is based on obeying the law, or in ESV, the law of works, or excuse me, the law of faith. Uh, let me just read what it says here. New Living Translation. Okay. No, because the acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's, it's based on faith. So the, the law of faith and the law of works. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. So is Abraham righteous because he has faith? And in that faith, he has a relationship with God. And he's walking with God and they're doing life together. Absolutely. Does that relationship require things of him? Absolutely. But he has the relationship because God said it was faith that he was looking for. In the end, if you want a relationship with God, you just got to do it God's way. Then in, in the next chapter, verse 5, it says, But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. In the end, the biblical idea is that faith is not a work but it is a catalyst for corresponding action or works, if you want to use that word. It just makes it confusing. Faith is a catalyst in your life to do the things that please God. Now, the bad news in this is we are broken and powerless. And it doesn't go away just because we have faith. In our faith, we still have broken parts of us. Is God at work to mature us and to grow us up and to be more like Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's some things that he will do right away when you become a believer. And there's other things that he wants to walk with you in the process. And if you lose sight of the fact that you have brokenness, you'll start being really self-impressed. And it's that self-impressed attitude, that superior attitude because you're in Jesus, that really stinketh to the rest of the world. It's the old King James way of saying it, but it stinketh muchly. Okay. Paul Tripp, in uh, the Reengage book, they just quote this little... Uh, uh, thing that he said in another book on marriage, and that is that I am my biggest marital problem. Now, this is a man that loves God, clearly a believer, clearly a righteous man in God, but clearly zoned into the fact that there's brokenness there. So in re-engage, we talk about you draw a circle around your own feet, and you and God go to work with all the brokenness that's in you. And that's the best way to fix your marriage is to work on yourself. But taking Paul's quote and kind of expanding it, you are also your largest parenting problem. You are your largest friendship problem. You are your largest cultural, uh, you know, the, the work environment at work, the culture of your, of your work environment. You're the biggest problem there, too, for you. Because you're the only one that can actually get you on board with what God wants to do in your life, and nobody else can. So if you're not doing your part, your life is just messier and messier and more and more broken. We are broken, but... In our brokenness, God is leading us to a righteous life. Now, I think part of the problem is we think, good, I am, I am righteous in Jesus, all done. I just find a nice place to sit and wait until, you know, he takes me home. No, there is the Holy Spirit that is given to us to empower us in our growth and development. And there's so often, I mean, the Holy Spirit should be a part of our everyday life. When you see miraculous things happening in Scripture, it is the work of the Spirit in people's lives. When we just think, well, I'm a good place with Jesus and that's good enough, we are totally missing out on what he has given to us to work in us, to lead us into all truth, to um, you know, resonate with us that we are the children of God. There's so many things that the Holy Spirit needs to do in our life, and we often leave him out of the mix. So when you think of what God wants for you, as he was talking to you know, the disciples that were there, that early group of disciples, and he is getting ready to ascend into heaven, what did he say? Did he say, go into all the world and be disciples? Is that what he said? That's the way we live our lives. You know, if I can just get to where I can live a righteous life in Jesus, that's, that's all really God, I mean, what could make him happier than that? Well, what could make him happier than that is that you would go into all the world and make disciples. And isn't that a very different picture? But we, we, it's not just in the Great Commission. It goes back to the book of Genesis. 
It goes through the Old Testament. What pleases God is when we lead others to righteousness. And it is the, it is the deal. That is, God wants us to help people walk by faith so that they will please him and be drawn into him and find themselves in Jesus. And we just lose sight of that. So the question is, this year, who all are you going to disciple? I could make it really hard and say, this week, who are you going to disciple? And it would make us go, uh, mm, uh, uh. well, right now I'm just kind of working on me. And once I get my act together with me and I'm not broken anymore, then I'll start discipling other people. We, we wish that was the right answer. But the bottom line is, we all have a commission from God to make disciples. The question is, are we? I will come back to this question. I'm just going to let it sit for a while, but we will come back here. Now, if you're asking, well, how on earth am I supposed to do that and, and do anything that would matter within the week? I would suggest Reach 2020 is a good place for you to start. This Friday night, we'll have a celebration of all the Wonderful things that people have done this last year. I mean, I don't like the word volunteer, but it seems to be the word that communicates the best. And we really want to honor the people that have volunteered here, their time and energy. I totally get that, you know, tithing is all about money. And we have a, a good number of people that tithe regularly, financially, and that's really great. But we have a boatload of people that go way beyond a tithe when it comes to their time. You know, if you see your, your work week as a 40-hour week, a tithe of that would be four hours of, of investment in, the, in the, you know, the, the environment of Vista. We got all kinds of people that blow four hours a week out the door. You know? And if time is money, which it often, you know, they give you money for your time. So there, there, is a, there is a correlation there. We have a lot of people that are very selflessly serving us. So we want to honor them. That's, that's Friday night. We're just looking back on the last year and honoring those who have given. But Saturday is all about helping people figure out how does God want them to invest in ministry at Vista this year. And we've got a whole bunch of different teams and a whole bunch of different roles on those teams. And there's all kinds of ways to get involved. But if you're just hearing about it and saying, well, that's for the people that are already kind of doing it, you're kind of missing out. The point is, we are making it not just doable, but likely. You know, we, we, we want to make it so, so it's easy for a person to find a place to serve and give and, and be some. Because, okay, newsflash everything we do. If you're a greeter at the front door, the end game for the greeter at the front door is that people grow up in Jesus. Right? Now, if you're a grump and you look like you're getting ready to bite them when they walk in the door, we're probably never going to have a chance to, to help them grow up in Jesus because they're going to run. But if, but if your contribution is done in a gracious way and in a winsome way where this, these, are, these are normal. I mean, Roger looks normal and you know, it, it, it looks, you know, looks normal and, um, you know, but, but they're going, you know, I, I, could, I could see being a friend with that guy, right? In the end, if, if we're drawing people in, that's giving us opportunity to, to make disciples, to help them grow up in Jesus. So I would suggest Reach 2020 would be a good, uh, now's time to save the date. You, we're getting close enough where your FOMO, you know, your fear of missing out on something else, that's going away. It's time to say, yes, I'm going to be there. Okay. But listen to, to this. Daniel 12, 3, just to see that it's not just in the Great Commission. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Right? It, it, it has been the heart of God that we would lead other people to righteousness all along. Isaiah 53, 11, My righteous servant, talking about Jesus, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. So you want to get involved in the ministry of Jesus in the world? Help people become righteous in God. And again, not perfect, righteous. By whose definition? God's. It's his eyes that are the final judge on, on whether we're righteous or not. He's the one we're trying to please. So that's the bad news. We're still broken, and there's still issues with that. The good news is this. In Christ, broken lives are made whole. If you've also been reading our New Testament reading, we're in the, the Gospels where Jesus is making people whole, you know, like every day. And it's lists of people that he's making whole in many different ways. It's what he does. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. If we're living our life in Jesus, people should be being discipled and they should be becoming more righteous. There should be more righteous people walking the planet because we're living in Jesus. 
Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault. And there it is again, in his eyes. Those are the eyes that we're trying to please. So if we're in Jesus, the good news is our lives become all about helping people become whole. Second, in Christ, it's about growth, not perfection. Now, I'm getting ready to read a verse, and you're going to say, no, that's not what that verse says. It's, it says we should be perfect. But you have to understand what that means. Colossians 1.28. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. So Paul, that's his definition of his ministry. My ministry is just to communicate with people about Jesus and, and you know, draw them in as much as I can. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. It sounds like it's saying, so you have to be perfect. See, I told you, you to be a Christian, you got to be perfect. No, no, no. Perfect means fully formed. That's what the word means. It means fully mature. So our job is to connect people with God and help them grow up in Jesus. To become mature, to grow. So in the end, the point of that verse isn't perfection, it's growth until we become all that God wants us to be. So for us, and I'll, I'll go back to this first. We're, we're looking at, at this from two lenses. We're, we're, we're a part of building the family of God, which is love, respect, and companionship. Or it's also about discipleship, which is growth, community, mission, and care. Those are the things that we're trying to build into people's lives. And the question still remains, who this year are you going to teach about love? Who this year are you going to teach about respect and about companionship and help them to experience those things? Who this year are you going to help them grow? And again, by growth, we mean maturity in Jesus, becoming more like Christ. Community. Now, the difference between community and companionship to me is, is interesting to note. Community is like the village that we're building. Companionship is like the friends and family that you're building. Okay, so companionship is a smaller group. Community is a larger group. Do you need companionship? Do you need community? As we talked about it last week, our culture has taken all the responsibilities of God and community and placed them on a few relationships. They, they buckle under the weight. You need close companions in life, but you also need the larger community because they serve some different roles. Also, we're helping people be on mission and have a purpose with their life. For us, our mission is connecting people with God. That's how we choose to express it. But it's everything we've been talking about today. We are here to disciple others, and we are here to help other people grow up in Jesus and become righteous before God. And then finally, care. And care just means to come alongside and to literally speak into a person's life or to encourage them. Sometimes it's translated encourage. Sometimes it's, it's, um, it could be translated care. But it, it just means you come alongside and help. Literally, that's what it means. So are you coming alongside the people in your life and helping them become more like Jesus and become righteous? Are you helping them help others to come alongside? I mean, it's, it's just uh, an ongoing flow of care that starts with you and then spreads through the people in your life. Friends, family, work associates, all of that. So I want to end with, uh, I think, a good place to end. Another crazy story, but for good reasons. So Jacob's walking along, minding his own business. And he runs into a guy on the road at night, and so they wrestle. How many think that's weird? Okay, I mean, in the, that day, I don't think wrestling was really a popular sport. And if anything, they carried swords and they would stab each other. They wouldn't just wrestle. But for some reason, these two people start wrestling. Now, <clears throat> I uh, wrestled in high school, and I coached wrestling as a youth pastor years ago. And I love the sport. And uh, I enjoyed the time I spent in this morning. But part of the reason I liked coaching is because I got to wrestle again. Call me crazy, but grown men don't wrestle unless you're Greg Bond. For those of you that know Greg Bond, he has been caught wrestling kids in our children's ministry who are getting more closer to middle school. And uh, to his wife's embarrassment and to the uh, detriment of his aging body, uh, he still does that. But He's the only, I started to say nobody does that, and Greg was sitting in the first service, and it's like, oh, he just proved me wrong. Greg still does that. Anyway, but as an adult, you know, you can still play tennis if you were a tennis player in high school. You can still play golf. You can still play softball, you know, as long as your knees hold out. You can even play soccer, but nobody still wrestles. Okay, so here's Jacob. He's an older man walking down the street, sees another dude, and they just start wrestling. The other thing I know from having coached wrestling... Uh, 
wearing wrestlers out to build their endurance is, is a common, uh, there's different things we do to, to make that happen. But the average person that's wrestling, after five, six minutes, they are completely exhausted. Right? How long did Jacob wrestle this guy? All night long. It's like a physical impossibility. We used to do an exercise where we, you get two of the heavier guys on the team, and they would wrestle each other, and then the one guy would go sit down, and then this guy would wrestle the next heaviest guy on the team, and then the next heaviest guy, and the next heaviest guy. So by the time you're done, the lightweight can beat the heavyweight because they're exhausted. And that doesn't take all night. That takes about, you know, 20 minutes. In the end, this is a crazy event, and the sun is beginning to rise, and there, there is no clear winner so the other guy goes and touches him on his hip, and his hip comes out of joint. Anybody ever had a hip come out of joint? That'll change your life, right? That's just, that's a little bit of pain happening all at once. So still, he doesn't want to let go. He says, I will not let go until you bless me. Okay, somewhere along this line, he figured out it was God. Now, I'd love to know if he figured out before or after he started wrestling the dude that it was God. It's like, oh, this guy's God. I'm going to wrestle him. I don't, that to me sounds crazy. But anyway, for whatever reason, somewhere along the way, like, he realizes it's God. And I just found out after the first service, because Carol Richardson was in here, that that was Don's favorite verse. That was his life verse. And I'm going, that is one of the screwiest life verses I've ever heard. But this is what I get out of the story. Jacob, realizing it's God, says, I will not let go until you bless me. Now, what Don took from that was, it is the favor of God that will give you favor with men and will give you purpose, life, the ability to, I mean, Don, I don't know if you could calculate the number of people that Don impacted there was a guy, Carol was just telling me this uh, before the service. There was one guy that walked up to Don at one of the places he was speaking and just said, you don't know me, but you have profoundly impacted my life. And over the course of my life now, I have planted thousands and thousands of churches in Mexico. Um, and, and Don is, is, again, a big part of the influence that made that happen. Don not only was a righteous man himself, though imperfect, an imperfect righteous man, a broken, in many ways, righteous man. But he influenced thousands who influenced thousands. Right? So, to me, the point of that whole thing is, how bad you want it. Because that's what we used to say to the guys. When, when we keep bringing in fresh wrestlers and we're just wearing them out and wearing them out. It's like, okay, we were, we were a relatively small school, but we won our sectional. Right? So it's like, how bad do you want that? How bad do you want to be, you know, the best team in, in your area? How bad do you want that? Okay, wrestle this guy. Now wrestle this guy. And we were just testing their endurance, but with that, their heart desire. The question for us is how bad do we want to be people that change our world? How bad do we want to lead other people to righteousness? How bad are we willing to let go of our self-focus, trying to make ourselves perfect so that people will think we're wonderful and forget ourselves? How bad are we willing to, to, get, to give more at Vista than we get? I mean, if you want to know what kind of ministry team member we're looking for on Saturday, we're looking for people that say, it is time for me to be a grown-up. It is time for me to give more than I get. How bad do we want it? Jacob wouldn't let go. So let's stand for prayer. Lord God, it is a, a day and a time where our culture just seems to be drifting more and more away from you. People are less and less understanding what faith even is, what a righteous life even is. So the good news is we have job security. We have mission security. What you have called us to do, there will always be a need for all of our days. But I just pray that you would touch us in such a way that we would remember our commitments to live a life for you, in you, and through you to bring righteousness to many. We ask in Jesus' name.